Hello, we welcome you here in our laboratory where we grow uh, the epitaxial structures that are later then to become uh, the multi-junction solar cells of the 50% project. Here in the background you can see the big reactor where we're actually depositing the material for the solar cells. My name is Patrick Schigula and uh, I'm a PhD student in the epitaxy team here at the Fraunhofer ESE. And my name is Malte Klitzke and I'm also a PhD student in the Epitaxy group and I'm developing the top cell structures for the 50% multi-junction solar cells. And now we will give you a short in introduction in the theoretical background of the epitaxial layer growth of multi-junction solar cells. This is a typical shiny um, wafer uh, made from gallium arsenide that we use for the epitaxial growth. And inside the reactor, the gas flows on the surface of this wafer and the uh, atoms are deposited um, on, on the surface. And how this works exactly, we will now explain in a model. Um, in the gas phase, we have different atomic species that are uh, in the form of precursors um, metal organic uh, compounds uh, flowing around and uh, at the elevated temperature that we have for the epitaxial growth typically around 600 degrees Celsius uh, there are a large variety of pre-reactions taking place and these uh, atomic bonds in the gas phase are then broken and uh, the atoms undergo various reaction chains uh, but in the end some of them will adsorbed to the sur surface and can then freely uh, diffuse on the surface. When they, found, when, when they find um, a step like this one here at the red atom, they can make atomic bonds to the crystal underneath and so the crystal grows. And then the next molecule uh, comes, makes the reactions, adsorbs, diffuses, some of them can also desorb again of the high temperatures and then there is some sort of equilibrium at which a certain um, ratio of the atoms deposit and there is a finite growth rate. And the different colors represent different atomic uh, species and we have a large variety of uh, atoms from the third and fifth um, column of the periodic table and so we can uh, put together our jigsaw puzzle of the 3-5 semiconductor crystal in exactly the way we want it. And what we can achieve with this mixing of different atoms for the crystal, uh, Malte is going to explain now. Here we can see which variety of elements we can use for this. This is called the 3-5 semiconductor map and on the x-axis you can see the lattice constant which means the distance between two atoms. On the y-axis we have the energy of the band gap shown and for example for gallium arsenide the band gap is 1.42 and until this level it is able to absorb light and to uh, produce electricity out of it. After this band gap it is transparent to light. In the 50% project we draw four or six junction solar cells and they are lattice matched for the gallium arsenide case and indium phosphide case. In another video we showed you already how we bond then afterwards these two wafers together in the direct wafer bonding method. We have in the four junction case two solar cells on the gallium arsenide lattice constant and two solar cells on the indium phosphide so, uh, lattice constant. Malte is now putting the wafers for the next full load run into the reactor. This of course takes some time so now we are going to uh, have a look at the rest in accelerated mode. Now that all wafers are put inside, the reactor lid closes again and the reactor is ready for the run to be launched. One of the big challenges in multi-junction solar cell growth is to achieve current matching of the individual subcells in order to have as high current for the overall device as possible. And uh, to achieve this, we use, amongst other techniques, in situ characterization. 
This is done with this tool here that employs three laser sources from the ultraviolet to the infrared light in order to probe the properties of the wafer surface while they rotate underneath this viewing port during the run. And the laser shines through this hole directly on the wafer surface and by measuring the reflected laser light that comes back into the detector we can monitor both the surface temperature, the curvature, the surface roughness, but also, and this is most crucial, the growth rate of the deposited, deposited layers. And with adjusting the layer time, we can adjust the uh, subcell absorber thickness and thus also the absorbed uh, photocurrent. Now, after the growth, we are going to characterize the samples regarding the lattice constant using X-ray diffractometer and band gap uh, energy using photoluminescence. Here we are in our laboratory for photoluminescence spectroscopy. With this setup, we can determine the band gap of our 3.5 semiconductor materials. To this end, we use a laser with a very short wavelength, in this case, blue light. The laser light excites charge carriers in the sample, which then can recombine again under the emission of a photon whose wavelength is given by the band gap of the material. Currently, we are measuring the absorber material of our top cell, aluminium galluminium phosphide, which has the highest band gap of all absorbers in the multi-junction solar cell. And thus, it emits visible red light, while all other absorbers emit infrared light. When the focused laser beam hits the sample, one can see the red photoluminescence from the sample, while next to the sample one sees the blue laser light, which is scattered. The fewer defects there are in the crystal, the more carriers will recombine radiatively and the higher the voltage of this cell will be. The brightness of the peak that we see here therefore tells us that the crystal was grown with very high material quality. From the intensity and wavelength maps that are being acquired, we can assess the, the homogeneity of the band gap and the crystal quality across the wafer. This is important for a high yield of well-working concentrator solar cells on each part of the wafer with a perfect current match in all of them. Now you can see our X-ray diffractometer on the left side and the related software on the right side. This tool is used to determine the lattice constant or in other words the distance between two rows of atoms in the crystal lattice. Additionally, this method can determine the thickness of certain layers and the overall crystallinity of the grown structures. For measurement, the mirror-like wafer is placed on the mounting table of the goniometer, which you can see in the middle of the video. The goniometer has, in our case, the possibility to move the sample with 7 degrees of freedom. The X-ray beam is generated in the part on the right side of the measuring chamber and is directed towards the sample. Several slits and different monochromators can be used to minimize the divergence of the beam and to generate precise results. If the goniometer has aligned the sample in a very certain way, the diffracted X-ray beam of a specific family of lattice planes can be recorded by the detector, which you can see on the left side in the video. In the software you can track all the alignment steps which the goniometer has to do very precisely to make in this case the diffraction of the 004 gallium arsenide reflex visible. If the sample is finally aligned, the tool performs a rocking curve at this reflex. In this case, the sample is an aluminium gallium indium phosphate layer of 500 nanometer thickness grown on a gallium arsenide substrate. Therefore, now you can see the gallium arsenide peak as the largest one at around 33 degrees, and the second peak, which is the aluminium gallium indium phosphate peak, approximately 150 arc seconds left to the gallium arsenide peak. For the 50% project, this method is very important to analyze the grown solar cells regarding crystallinity, compositions of mixed semiconductor alloys and layer thicknesses. The layer thicknesses play an important role in the current match of the subcells because thicker absorber layers will generate more current and the subcell with the lowest current limits due to the serious connection the total current.